And our speaker today is John Anderson, uh, president of the National Academy of Engineering, and we're extremely I'm going to say a few words first of all about John Hall. <coughs> uh, John Hall received his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Vanderbilt in 1955. He was a four year letterman uh, on the football team and a captain in his senior year. Uh, he was Vanderbilt's first academic All American uh, in 1954. He was uh, after leaving Vanderbilt, uh, a couple of years after leaving Vanderbilt, he joined Ashland. Uh, oil company in Kentucky uh, and rose through the ranks to become uh, chairman and CEO. He's long been a supporter. He was long a supporter of educational initiatives and institutions uh, throughout the Appalachian region. Uh, there's a very nice video that was produced by Kentucky Public Television, uh, which if you just Google the Google Kentucky Commodore, uh, you'll find that video. And that's a really interesting video to watch and learn about John. Uh, he was a past member and chair of the Vanderbilt Board of Trusts, inducted into the Engineering School Academy of Distinguished Alumni in 1983. He's married to Donna's Gopa Hall. That's a very nice picture here of uh, John and Donna in the bottom right hand corner. And together they've been uh, strong supporters of Vanderbilt as well as many other educational institutions uh, in the Appalachian region. Uh, sadly, John passed away on Thanksgiving Day uh, of last year. And uh, for all who knew him, uh, we miss him. Uh, he was a great individual, um, very kind and very uh, giving to all who knew him. And uh, so now I'll introduce you to our speaker today, John Anderson. Uh, John received his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Delaware in 67, uh, his PhD from Illinois in 71. He began his academic career as an assistant professor in chemical engineering at Cornell, then moved to uh, CMU where he rose up through the ranks, uh, and became a university professor. He was chair of chemical engineering, dean of engineering, dean of engineering at Carnegie. And then in 2004, he became provost of his Western Reserve University. And then um, in 2007, president of the Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, and since 2019 has been the president of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, among numerous awards and honors, he won the uh, Professional Progress Award from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers uh, in 1989. Uh, that's now called the Andy Akrafos Award. It wasn't called that back then. But, uh, he was elected to the NAE in 92, elected to uh, a fellow of the uh, AAAS in 2001, elected to uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2005, and in 2014 was appointed to the National Science Board. So we're very excited to have John here. Some of us have known John for many years. Uh, for me personally, it goes back to the late 80s, early 90s, uh, when John was a member of the Assembly Advisory Board for Mark Grant, and the man Ford and I had at the uh, University of Virginia with from IPM. And so that brings us to our lecture today. Uh, the title is Engineering's Role in Creating Technology, Working in a Number of Understanding. And please welcome uh, John Anderson. One thing about living a long time is you can put a lot of things under your name. <laughs> Peter reminded me of that slide of how old I am, you know, way back. You know, you can see here the chuckling by the uh, uh, by the younger folks in the audience. But it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm honored actually to be part of the uh, John and Donna Hall lecture series, uh, and I'll make a few comments about John Hall at the at the end. Great leader, but I really appreciate it. Um, one of the, uh, uh, when I was younger, I would uh, show a lot of equations. That's what you do when you don't really know what you're talking about. Put a lot of equations on there. People think you do know what you're talking about. You have to 
Uh, and uh, but as you get older, you kind of forget what the equations are. I'm in trouble reading them. So I actually only have one equation in all my slides today. And people who know me would think that's astonishing. You know, there's only one equation. It's a real easy one, simple one as well. Uh, there. I remember whispering to uh, uh, when I was an assistant professor at Cornell, and we some person my age came in and talked. And, no equations or anything and talked about philosophy of science or something or engineering and i bumped the guy and said Dries, i said this is pathetic i said if i ever get like that shoot me <laughs> and i reconsidered over the years <laughs> so I, I don't want to be shot you know and so uh, and i have something called anderson's law and that is uh the product in anyone's life the product of creativity times perspective as a constant and perspective goes up with time. So <laughs> you, uh, you're talking to you know, you're talking about perspective, which you see, you know, and that's that's what we can do, my generation uh, can do. Um, I want to talk about a, just a few things here. I'm going to explain to number. So though you may not know that word, I think it's been a lot to find it. Uh, I'm talking about the evolution of engineering education. The triad is engineering, science, and technology. But there's a problem with that first line. And the problem is engineering is left out. It's only science and technology. Engineering is not in it. You know, name me a technology that did not involve engineering. I think you'll come up empty on that, that particular request. So we're talking about the evolution of engineering education briefly, and then engineering versus science. What's the difference? Working in the phenomena of understanding, what did, what, that's what engineers are doing, basically. And then talk about unintended consequences that's going to lead me to the Ashland oil spill near Pittsburgh that John Hall showed a lot of integrity and honesty by taking action in that particular case. Some of what I'm saying is in an article we wrote for something called Issues in Science and Technology just came out with Bill Homick. Bill Homick is a chemical engineering professor at the University of Illinois. And he writes, uh, he gets podcasts, he has a podcast with a million followers about uh, the technology, uh, the, the engineering and science behind technology. It's really, really very good. But several books I just came out with another one as well. So we wrote an article together and it's in that. So some of that, what I say here is in that particular article. Now, the evolution of engineering, I put it on one slide over. You know, engineering really started back when the pyramids were built, probably before that. You know, there's a lot of engineering that done, and uh, not much science was known, but engineering was done back then. It was just something as a theme to hit on. But the mili U.S. Military Academy, West Point, was really started the engineering trend in the United States. And uh, RPI and uh, Norwich College, Universities were the first engineering colleges. So RPI lays claim, I think, uh, legitimately to being the, the continuous first engineering college in the United States. Uh, the Morrill Land Act, uh, which created the large public universities, uh, really had in mind engineering at the time and science, you know, to, to help develop the economy. Agriculture was a big part of this. And then in the early uh, 20th century, accreditation began. And then a very important report came out in 1955 called the Grinter Report. And then follow that was followed by ABET and some of these things. So this is kind of a timeline that uh, the country realized that it needed people who uh, contributed engineering and science. It's a very good group. Um, now, Grinter is an interesting person. Uh, he doesn't get enough credit, but I've circled him. This is a picture taken actually at the Illinois Institute of Technology called the Armour Institute back, back then. Uh, and uh, uh, in, and uh, he, uh, I won't say who else is in this photo, but he headed the civil engineering department at IIT, and then he went to be dean of the graduate school at the University of Florida. If you go to the University of Florida, there's a Grinter Hall. Grinter, uh, very highly uh, recognized there. He was the president of ASCE, but he headed a committee that looked at um, engineering education. And the problem at the time was that science was overshadowing engineering and engineering was considered a vocation. In fact, even today, some universities 
few, just a very few, but some uh, think of engineering as a vocational training rather than a true education. The Grinter, the Grinter Committee felt that if we added more science, we could not only improve engineering, but also raise its stature. That was kind of the basic idea. This report is, you could look this report up and people would not. Now, what about the national academies? Uh, and, and because they're science, engineering, and now medicine, and that was great. In 1963, uh, 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed a, bill, a congressional charter about forming the National Academy of Sciences. He needed advice about the military as well as developing the country after that. So, so about half the members, I forget how many were in that original group, they showed some there. About half were what you call hardcore engineers, the other half were scientists and, and maybe some business people. And that's the beginning of it in 1863. In 1916, um, Woodrow Wilson signed the, uh, the bill charter for the National Research Council because they knew they needed more than just that small group of people, they needed volunteers from the whole science engineering enterprise. So Wilson signed this to recruit specialists to give scientific advice to the government. And then in 1964, the National Academy of Engineering was formed. Now, why did it take so long? It's 100 years between the two. And the reason is that the NAA, National Academy of Sciences became almost exclusively an academic club, basically. They weren't taking people from industry. But the government wants people from industry to give advice because 85% of STEM workers are in the industry, 50% or 10% are in academia. And, and of course, the practitioners are in the industry, so they recognize it had to be done. And then not many engineers are being elected to the NAS. It's a very small number every year. So it was formed under the charter of the National Academy of Sciences, which is a congressional board. And these are the original ones. Now, the, the, guy, the guy in the center uh, is uh, Terman, the one uh, with the full head of hair, before you know him in the back row. That's a term, a term from, um, which determined from Stanford, and he's the one that got Hewlett and Packard started. The famous story got Stanford uh, involved in entrepreneurial activities. So he's a very big player. And there are a lot of others. Second from the right in the back, the real tall guy. If you ever do uh, control theory, that's Bodhi. Bodhi Plus in there. It's an interesting group of people. These are these are twenty, uh, fifteen of the twenty-five original members of. Academy. Striking thing you'll notice is that they all dress the same. Right? Uh, they are all white males, right? So it's kind of a very undiverse group. And if you ask any one of them a question, you probably got the same advice from everybody. You know, so <laughs> 25 independent advice. So things have changed since then. But anyway, this is the background for engineering, science, and uh, and the National Academies to contribute to the country. Uh, to summarize again, the evolution of engineering education, there's a very good article by Bruce Seeley and uh, in a publication called Educating the Engineer. It comes from the National Academy of Science. It's a, it's a free download. You get a PDF of this for free if you download it. And Seeley has a great article in there, really great history about engineering education. He talks about the Grinter Report as well in there. ABET 2000 was a very important point uh, in, in the accreditation because uh, that's the time when ABET did their A through K criteria and said, you define engineering education for your university. So Caltech might be different than University of Delaware, okay? There's certain principles, there's certain, but there's, there's differences between university cultures. So if you have to define what your engineering objectives are for education and then show that you're Accomplishing those objectives. That was a very big thing. I was, I was somewhat involved in that in 2000, and there was a lot of disgruntlement with the, uh, with the ABAD at the time. So it kind of healed things, and I think that things have gone well. I'll mention that, come back to those criteria. And the issues that have been dealt with since then are science versus engineering. How much of each do you teach? Teams versus individuals, systems versus components, general education. What do you mean by general education? What goes into it? Uh, and that, and computation, of course, which has been had a huge impact on, on uh, engineering education and practice in general. 
And let's talk about computation first. So I decided to give you three levels of computation. Okay. On the left is a slide where I used, and that I used up all four years of my undergraduate and a couple years of my graduate education. You can do a lot of that slide roll. I, I, I kind of forgot how to, how to use it now, but it was a ticket. I didn't even remember that, those things. And in my uh, sophomore year at Delaware, I used the IBM 1620, wrote my first computer code, so that was computation. And for those younger people, uh, you submitted a, a deck of cards with, you know, punched out. You got another deck back 24 hours later, a compiler, you put that in. And if you're lucky, in 48 hours, you got your answer. So there, there were no crash all night to do homework. You had to think ahead. For that. And then we have laptops, which I think are the greatest invention. You can carry it around. You've got the, your whole life with you all the time without carrying a lot of books. These big changes in engineering practice and education even affects the way you might teach mathematics because of symbolic operations. And uh, you don't have to derive every calculus uh, uh, formula you know, yourself. Uh, and there's a lot of things that can be done in education and virtual meetings and so on. So in, in computation, big changes. And of course, there are big mainframes now and supercomputers and so on to go with that. Um, now, I want to talk about how you divvy up the curriculum next. And I showed this slide, this is in honor of Peter Cummings and his friends in thermodynamics. In chemical engineering, we have something called triangular phase diagrams, right? I don't, I don't think we teach that anymore, do we? I don't know, I haven't been in the classroom for a while. But the great thing about an equilateral triangle is any point in the middle, if you sum up the, the distances to the sides equals the uh, bottom to the top, it's a constant. So, so it's 100%, so anywhere you move in there, you're at 100% of whatever you're doing, but you have different contributions. So where that point is, S would be measured from the other side. That would tell you how much of S you have. And move the other way, E, how much of E you have. And T tells you how much of T you have. So let's look at the, the composition there and the trajectory uh, and some of the distances. And I'm only going to talk about engineering, if, uh, technical courses. So let's put science, engineering, and technology on there and look at the timeline of what happened. So in, in the 1800s, essentially all the education was a lot of technology. That's empirical things, you know. Uh, you look up uh, uh, charts for pumps or uh, distances and so on, and, uh, and not much calculation, okay? And, and, some, and some engineering, hardly any science. And then we move down to the 1920s, science becomes a little more important. There's something called the Wickenden Report. I think that was a case institute in the early 1920s. And he had something where he said, we need a little more science. And then you have the Gritter Report, where math and physics and chemistry uh, move into and then, uh, the 1970. And then all of a sudden we get computer science and life sciences. So today we're at a point where uh, there's a fair amount of science, fair amount of engineering, and much less technology in the curriculum. So, so there's big changes over time that you can see on a, on a, on a diagram like that. Uh, so let's go back to the science. How much science should we have in a curriculum? How much engineering? And then a third, another question would be, how do we teach science in engineering? Do we, do we teach science when we need to know science? Do we teach it in parallel? You teach it in series. The old style was you teach science in series. You take two years of all your science courses, then you do engineering. Now I think we've agreed that maybe in parallel teaching science and engineering and mathematics, we can do a better job of education because people learn things as they need them and they'll remember them more. So I've made a list of things. I think that's engineering versus science. Now, why am I interested in this? Well, first, I'm the president of National Academy of Engineering. <coughs> My job to you know to, to carry the flag for engineering, and I tried to do that. And about ten years ago, I started getting more interested in how in the differences because as an academic, I did a lot of science. I'm not sure how much engineering I did in my research. You know, I taught engineering courses, but I did a lot of research in sciences. So how uh, uh, how do I view engineering versus versus science? Is, is, does engineering follow the scientific method? 
And our, my conclusion is no, it doesn't. It's a different kind of method. We use the scientific method, but engineering itself follows. So I put it here. One thing is engineer is a verb. Science is always a noun. But engineering is a verb. That means action. So engineering or action. We're goal-oriented. Engineering. I want to I want to make something that you can hold in your hand, right? And uh, talk to anybody in the world, whatever. That's a goal. You know, uh, science uh, is more knowledge-oriented. By the way, I'm not saying one's more important than the other. I'm just saying there's a difference. It's knowledge oriented. We want to discover things, find out why things work. I'm interested in that as well. I love science. So engineers create, scientists discover. Engineers work more in systems. How do things fit together? If I, if I fix, if I do something here, what, it, what happens here and so on in the process, in a material thing or whatever. Uh, scientists look at components, try to make it simple, get down to one thing. In engineering design, we were talking last night, Dean and I about it. Design is a prize skill. You learn about design. In science, design is important, but it's an adjunct. How do I design an experiment? How do I do something else like that? It's not considered a part of the tool, your toolkit. And finally, engineering uses heuristics. We call those rules of thumb. Where science likes to work with knowns, you know, we know this, we know this. So there are some differences. So the engineering methods based on the left hand side, science based on the right hand side, both important, critical, and when they work together, life is, is really very good. So if we go to the back, uh, and this, this slide I wanted to, when, when I'm asked about this, I asked the National Academy of Engineering eight years ago for a definition of engineering or a difference between science and engineering. And what they gave me was this, and I have tried to improve upon it, and I haven't been able to do it. Theodore von Karman was the first winner of the Medal of Science, 1962, received from President Kennedy. He's an engineer, an aeronautical engineer. He got the Medal of Science. And uh, he said, scientists study the world as it is, Engineers create the world that never was. So if you think about that, create is important, but we don't emphasize that word in education nearly enough. Uh, creating, we talk about solving problems, problem solving that is important. We don't talk enough about creating. I don't think that I don't think the uh, smartphone was was designed because to solve a problem. I think it was designed to make life better for us, but it wasn't designed to solve any particular problem that one of the greatest creations can have even a laptop. So uh, creating things that make us that have never existed before, that's what you're doing when you're doing engineering. And if we go back to our phase diagram chart here, science uh, is on the left. So there's a lot of science and a little bit of technology, hardly any engineering at all. And engineering has a fair amount of science, a little bit of technology, and then, uh, a lot of engineering, of course. So there's a difference. And there is an asymmetry, which I think is not healthy for the scientists, for the science majors. The science majors don't take any engineering, but the engineering majors take a lot of science. I, it never really dawned on me that this is an asymmetry that we have in education. It would be beneficial, probably, to have it go the other way to some extent. Now, I want to go back to ABET, the Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology. And they had these outcomes in two, the year 2000 were A through K. Those of you who have done visits know about A through K. And, and now it's one through seven, which is much better. And what's really interesting about this is every one of those seven talks about an ability to do something. It doesn't talk about knowledge of doesn't use the word knowledge, it's an ability to do something. And that's what engineering is all about, ability to do something. And this is my one equation. <laughs> I think everybody's gonna understand. The education, I put this fancy summation symbol in there <laughs> to try to impress you. Um, but education is more than the courses you take. I remember that statement, that's not original with me. Somebody else said that. Said, that's great, you know, you're right. That's why online learning will never replace true education. It can augment it, but it will never replace it because education is about the other things you do 
in the context of those courses. If, if nothing else, please remember my one equation. Um, so the bottom line here is engineering and science are different endeavors. And this is the things I like to stress. Engineering is goal-oriented, science is discovery-oriented. Most, we're most productive when there's a synergy between the two. Both depend on mathematics and computational tools. And the fourth one is underappreciated. Often engineering pre precedes, comes before science. And then science says, wow, why did that happen? And we have to figure it out. And then that's how you improve something. So if you invent something, it works, it does well. You study it, you find out why it's happening. You'll learn something about the basic science and then you can make it better. And that's a great synergy. So sometimes engineering can, can propel science in, in certain directions. And one of the, one of the uh, 14 grand challenges of the National Academy of Engineering put out in 2008 <coughs> is about uh, some, uh, uh, engineering enabling science. One of the 14 is engineering enabled science. So it's very important. And the last, the last line on this slide is I think something I, know, I feel and that, and that pertains to maybe all of us in this, in this room is, is that engineering and science are defined by what one is doing, not by what one studied. So there are a lot of people who went, never took an engineering course that are doing engineering, especially in industry. And there's a lot of engineers who are really doing science. And sometimes the same person is doing both in the same day. Science and engineering, but it's important to keep that the, the separate. Uh, keep the, the keep the keep the uh, concepts separate. Now, uh, going back to this difference and the stature of engineering, which was the Grinter report was all about. Uh, NSF has come a long way. Uh, NSF was a source of my income for a long time. A lot of research grants from there. I love NSF and. Uh, and uh, I was on the National Science Board, which oversees it. Trans Cordova was the director until about even two years ago. And she did a great job, a wonderful job there. Uh, those of you who have grants from NSF, thank her because she, she was in Congress, steps of uh, Congress, many, many days of the year arguing for NSF. Uh, now, France is an astrophysicist. But, Talking about engineering and science. My first two grants from NSF came in 1972 and 1974. And both, and both of those came from a division of the mathematics and physical sciences. The engineering director did not exist when I was applying for grants in the 1970s. It was the engineering directorate, which is now the largest director in NSF was established in 1981 by John Slaughter when he became an engineer, he became director of NSF. And she's talking about that here. Right? Uh, and uh, now, it, then SICE, computer, uh, the, the uh, computer uh, and information science and engineering directorate, which funds computer science, was started in the 1990s sometime. Okay? And, uh, uh, and it's, impacts engineering quite a bit. And now there's a third director. So, we, so since 1981, we've gone from engineering being a subset of science, to engineering being a very important part of NSF. I think that's important. I think it's important for all of us. It doesn't mean the, the support for science has not gone down. NSF has just got money to do these things. I think uh, it's a really important uh, trajectory for us. Now I want to talk about a number of, of understanding have trouble with that word. Uh, uh, Bill Homick introduced me to this word. What does he mean by that? We're, we're working in a number of understanding. I don't know how many the people who study optics know this. this thing, but I didn't. Okay. So if you look at that the, the picture, that bowling pin on the left side of the slide, okay, there's a main shadow. Then there's like a grayish shadow on the outskirts. And that's, a, that's a number. And it has to do with uh, reflected light from an object. Okay. So what we mean here is that engineering proceeds because we have a goal. We have to do something. We have to improve the, the traffic situation in, in this area. We have to do something else. 
but we don't understand everything. We still have to do something, and we have to goal oriented. So we're, we understand some things, but I mean, that's what we mean by working in the, the number of understanding. Now we have to talk about technology. What is technology? Uh, technology emerges from the number. Uh, so what is it? Uh, Anna Harrison was the uh, president of AAAS and also the American Chemical Society, first woman to be, she's a chemist. But she understood that science, engineering, and technology work together. Technology is the result of science and engineering. Uh, but unfortunately, the word engineering is left out of, of this today. Somehow it disappeared from, from my review. Uh, the technology is the result. Science, scientific method, and engineering are the, are the processes to get there. I don't think she got it all right because engineering is more than solving problems. Engineering is creating things that we don't even know we want or need that improves society in some way. But she still got, I think, got the essence of that. She's written on this. Uh, she's no longer with us. She was the head of uh, chemistry at Mount Holyoke College and a very important person in the scientific field. Now, the the problem here is um, unintended consequences. And um, I want to talk a little bit about that. Technology emerging, uh, first I'll talk about it, technology emerging from the phenomenon, I'm sorry. Uh, and the first was ammonia, fi fixing of, of uh, nitrogen and hydrogen to form ammonia. That was done in 1910 by Hayfritz Haber, who uh, it's called the Haber-Bosch process. Bosch was also involved and uses an iron, iron oxide catalyst plus promoters. This it operates at very high temperatures and uh, under DC or something like that and, and uh, very high pressures. Without this process, we wouldn't have fertilizers. Without fertilizers, a lot of people would die of starvation. So this is extremely important. Uh, um, ammonia was extremely important in, in the world in the food situation. Right? That Fritz, Fritz Haber did not know the mechanism of the catalyst. He just knew this thing worked. You know, you put iron oxide in there and you mess around with temperature and pressure, and pretty soon you got it to work. And then he, he optimized the process more. He's a brilliant guy uh, and, uh, and he got it to go. So the mechanism of the reaction wasn't known, but he knew enough uh, that, that, that something called cat catalysis worked. And it could make nitrogen and hydrogen come together on, on the surface of the particles and create ammonia. Another one is Chardonnay silk, the first synthetic fiber by uh, Galera Vertigaud. And he uh, exhibited it in Paris in 1889. He actually worked for Pasteur. And uh, they were trying to, I think, silkworms were being attacked by uh, some organism, microorganism. So they were working on something that could save the silkworms. And uh, but he found out that this nitrocellulose, this polymer they had, uh, when he splashed it down, he could stretch it out like fibers would form. And so they made an artificial silk. We call it rayon today. Rayon. It's not nitrocellulose as other chemicals are used. The nitrocellulose is flammable and uh, dangerous. But um, at the time he did this, no one knew about polymers. In fact, atoms. Molecules and atoms were not totally uh, appreciated or, or let's say uh, accepted by the total scientific community. So certainly polymers were not understood. So the two examples of engineering technology that did not ha have science behind it. Science came, science came after. Another one is the cell phone. Interesting story. Uh, I, I know Marty Cooper very well. He won the Draper Prize. He shared the Draper Prize for the cell phone. He was, he was the vice president of Motorola and, and uh, product development. And uh, he wrote a book called Cutting the Cord. So Marty Cooper, shown on the right hand side of the slide, talking into the first cell phone call on April 3rd, 1973. You see the size of the phone. So that's something you put in your back pocket there. And it only had enough power in it for like 10 minutes uh, of use. 
but he called his compatriot at the Bell Labs. And here's, here's the, inter the interesting story, and it's fascinating. Bell Labs was at the Monopoly. And to be honest with you, a lot of times, no, uh, at and I'm talking about the Monopoly, and they own Bell Labs. And at and wasn't kind to small inventors. Uh, if you had something, they would basically try to stuff you out at the time because they had a monopoly. But there was competition between Motorola, which is an up and coming company, and, and AT&T. And AT&T, Bell Labs, developed uh, cells, the idea of cells, uh, electromagnetic waves going from region to region, you can pass them in there. And using it, the, the idea was they would use it for automobile to automobile conversation. So you'd be talking to someone in another car. Because their, their, their machine to do the talking weighed 35 and 40 pounds, put that in the car, and that was they were that, they were going to go with that. Hardy Cooper in early 1973 had this idea. He said everybody should be able to have something in their hand that can talk to anybody else in the world. That's what he said at that time in, in 1973. They said you're crazy, you can't do it. Well, microelectronics was still being developed. Uh, they, they didn't have uh, uh, integrated circuits at that point. But they, they made some circuits uh, in there. So he, they, they put 100 engineers in Motorola on this, in Bet Bank, $100 million to develop this. And, and they got the Federal uh, Communications Commission to give them the rights to do it and to use at and cellular network. And he made the first call at the Bell Labs, uh, which irritated the hell out of his competitors because they thought they were going to do it for phones. And uh, so they, he had this idea that they didn't have like electronics, they didn't have design, it was handheld. They didn't understand how electromagnetic waves would, uh, uh, were transmitted completely in the Earth's atmosphere. It's a lot of static, a lot of things happening. It's not, not simple at all. Um, but they went from this idea and the prototype in three months. It's all described in this book. And the company bet on it, made the first call. 10 years later, for cell phone sold. Dynatech. So it's quite a, quite a story. And uh, this is the size of the phone. And there actually are some replicas of this shoe or boot phone design produced, which led to the final one. So there's an example, another example of, of uh, uh, engineering kind of being in the number of understanding that you knew in some things, you didn't know everything, and you had to have confidence that you could solve problems. Okay, I can't see my way through the whole thing, but I could actually, we can, we can get there if we work on it. It took a lot of imagination and commitment. Another one was Francis Arnold. Francis Arnold gave this lecture a couple, three years ago, I guess, it was three years. Okay, uh, she was a really creative person. I first met her when she was a graduate student at Berkeley. She was interviewing for jobs. And it turns out in Pittsburgh, I lived four blocks from where her father, where she grew up, uh, four, yeah, four houses where she grew up, four blocks. Um, but she has a BS in aerospace engineering and a PhD in chemical engineering, and she ends up doing evolution of enzymes. And so when you see this, <coughs> Uh, is a catalyst of 500 amino acids and enzyme, roughly 20 amino acids. Tells you how many permutations you can have. That number 20 to 500 power is it's, it's unthinkable. So the goal is to produce enzymes to catalyze reactions to produce chemicals of use, often in harsh environments. And that's it. And it's intelligent trial and error with some science that you call it directed evolution. And she was quoted here is really, really nice. Wonderful feature of engineering by evolution is that solutions come first. An understanding of the solutions may or may not come later. But of course, an understanding is desirable because if you can understand why, then you can cut down the time. That's where science could come in to do a lot. So it's this, this hand in hand uh, interaction between the two. So these are examples of, of how engineering contributed to society really big examples that have a great impact without understanding the science behind it. So when someone says to you, engineering is just applied science, uh, you tell them that they're wrong. It's much more than that. And sometimes science uh, it results from the engineering that's done. Now, 
Um, <clears throat> now I want to talk about the fourth thing on my list, unintended consequences of engineering and technology. Engineering has not always done things for the benefit of society. It started out doing that, trying to do it, but there are uh, most, most are unintended consequences. Uh, a good discussion with Scott Gulcher yesterday about, you know, when, when in your process do you start thinking about unintended consequences? You should start thinking about them at the beginning of what you're doing, not the end, because you've committed too much and to stop it. This is a fascinating story. Thomas Vigley, who was educated as a mechanical engineer, but it really was a chemical engineer at General Motors. And he won these big awards, Perkin Medal, Priestley Medal, Gibbs Award, elected to the National Academy of Sciences as an engineer in 1942, and invented two important chemicals that were considered saviors for society, the tetraethyl lead and freon. Let's talk about tetraethyl lead. Tetraethyl lead, uh, cars back, back then had problems with knock. Combustion process wasn't working properly. He found, and I don't know exactly know the mechanism, he actually figured it out systematically that if you put a small amount of lead in the gasoline and you have to combine it with ethyl molecule, with tetraethyl with ethyl molecules, you could, you could reduce this knock almost zero, and it gave you better fuel efficiency. So tetraethyl lead had really two very positive things. Better fuel efficiency, you use less gasoline, and not went away. Unfortunately, and I should have known this before, lead is a neurological agent. It's, it it, it uh, is really bad for human beings or any living animal, really. And, uh, and I don't know what they were thinking, but that lead has to come out of the pipe of the car to get, you know, exhaust. It's not going to disappear. It's not going to be burned up. So it has to come out. The, the level of lead in the blood of all the population 20 years after this was up. So it measured and it was up. And then some workers had died in the production of detrimental lead to be added to the gasoline. And finally, it was banned, I think, in the, in the 80s. Uh, it, uh, those of you, some of you remember, we, we have unleaded gasoline, you know, when you go on this, into the gas stations. So uh, in, in the 80s, we have unleaded gasoline and pretty now there's no leaded gasoline. <coughs> so that was, a, a, that was a, a, a uh, invention that looked really good. By the way, uh, Midgley died, and I think he died of blood poisoning at the age of 55. Um, Freon. Now, this is a really interesting one because before Freon, before uh, the we call them uh, CFCs, chlorofluoro uh, hydrocarbons, before that, people who used ammonia and other materials like that as refrigerants because it has to have the right vapor pressure uh, and, uh, uh, and, <coughs> uh, and boiling point and so on uh, to work in your refrigerators. Right? But it leaks sometimes, and uh, people are getting sick, and, and ammonia, if you don't do too much of it, then it becomes uh, deadly. So it's not a good thing to have in a house, ammonia uh, out like that. So he did a lot of experiments, and this was considered a godsend. So all the refrigerators had Freon in them for a long time. In fact, he did to introduce it to show how safe it was, Mitchley uh, took some Freon, and he inhaled it. So, and it doesn't hurt you if you inhale Freon, there's no effect goes right through you or it comes out of your lungs or whatever. And he also showed that it put out, you could extinguish a flame, it's not, it's not flammable. So it's a great material, it wasn't going to harm you, had great boiling point and uh, uh, big pressure and so on, and great uh, physical properties for, uh, for, for refrigeration in the house. Well, what was the problem? It, it, it ate the ozone up in the, uh, in the, uh, the stratosphere and created the ozone hole. Uh, now, you couldn't really see this one. You didn't really know that was going to happen. So then, eventually, it's banned, or, and uh, you go to fluoro hydrocarbons, and now they have substitutes. They've been working on substitutes all along. So there's an example of uh, the first tetralethyl lead they should have known 
The second one was really hard to see, you know. But you know, you, the stuff goes in the atmosphere, so you have to ask what's what's the fate of anything that goes in the atmosphere. And that's the same thing about plastics. You know, what's the fate of this? We throw this stuff away. Where does it go? You have to ask yourself those questions about consequences on society. This leads me to the Ashland Oil Spill and John Hall. Uh, this was a, I was in Pittsburgh at the time, 1988. Uh, it happened on the Monongahela River. Uh, in fact, I lived uh, to the left of the red dot, just west of the red dot, the suburbs there. Uh, and uh, Pittsburgh is to the right, as you've been to Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, they were storing, storing diesel fuel in a tank that had been retrofitted, moved from another place to there, and never inspected. And uh, the, there was a weakness in it that was actually known why the tank broke and all. And uh, a whole bunch of, a lot of oil came out, almost almost a million gallons. Uh, half of that got into the Monongahela River, which is the source of drinking water for uh, towns up and down the Yellow River. Huge cleanup, very costly, maybe $40 million back in those days or more to do everything. Uh, and, uh, and so Ashland Oil was responsible for this. But what it did is it triggered, it triggered uh, uh, regulations on above ground storage facilities in the Germans. So Pennsylvania and other states developed very stringent laws about it afterwards. But Ashland Oil, because it had a great leader in John Hall, took, took the blame and he admitted, we didn't do it right. We made a big mistake, it's our fault. We're gonna pay for this. We're going to, uh, we're gonna make it right. Apparently he visited that area, that region south of Pittsburgh, talked to the community, said, no, we're not denying it. So on, you know, you sue us. And they, they did a, a uh, a really good thing. This is about leadership. I was talking to some students today about leadership. And when you make a mistake, that's up to it, stand up to it and make it right. That's the right thing to do. And that's what uh, John Hall did. John Hall was a football player, as mentioned. I showed a picture of him. Uh, he was an academic All American. He was heralded for this work as well as some other things he did at National Royal. Great leader and someone who I think we can talk about long time about uh, to students at Vanderbilt about what, what it takes to be a leader like this. So it's a very good thing. Um, what, what, what could have happened in Ashland? Well, they, number one, they should inspect the vessel, but they also, this goes for today, they should have built a containment that they could they could collect all the oil if it ever leaked out. It wouldn't get to it wouldn't get to the water, right? And have emergency cleanup facilities. And that's what that's what he noted. So let me uh, just finish with um, these takeaways from, from my talk uh, that uh, just please remember engineers create the world and never was. That's, that's what you're doing as engineers. Uh, engineering and science are parallel processes, both to be respected. And we often work without total scientific understanding. As scientific knowledge advances, engineering goes beyond that knowledge, pushes science even further. So we're pushing each other to get there. And we should change science and technology to science, engineering, and technology. And that's my campaign. I might fail on that one, but I'm going to do my best to get it in there. You know, why is this stuff important? Several reasons. We're trying to attract people into engineering. It's important that we do that. We need all the talent we can get from all segments of our society. And so we have to show that engineering is important. When we were left out of something like science and technology, it diminishes the value of engineering and the public eye. And so we need to do it. Secondly, decisions are made in DC and other places, Washington, DC, about resource allocation. We want to show that we, we deserve to be supported in our work and research and development. So it's crucial that for those two reasons, uh, to, uh, to get the word engineering in there. The final bullet I think is underappreciated and some, uh, I look at this as something we can do in the engineering educational field later. 
is talk about the social consequences of engineering. That you, you're an engineer, you're designing something, inventing something, whatever. You have to think in the early part of that of what could possibly happen to it, how could it be used, and how can we limit that in some way. Uh, and, uh, and so anticipate unintended consequences. And we really need to, to have the help of our social scientist collaborators on this, and especially in courses. Now, I'm not talking about, well, you have to take two courses in psychology and one course in, in economics and where I'm talking about co-teaching things and getting social sciences into the engineering design process, uh, maker's process, and so on. That we understand not, ethics is fine, but to teach ethics, you have to know what's right and wrong. Social scientists tells you what's right, what the right thing is to do. So I think social science is important. Now, just my last comment here is a story that tries to illustrate the difference between scientists and engineers. So uh, this story was told to me by somebody, and I like to repeat it. A scientist and an engineer were very good friends uh, worked together, but uh, had differences in some ways, but were friends and they hiked a lot and went out to the wilderness. So one time they were on a hiking trip, scientist and an engineer, and um, the, uh, they found a nice place to camp, hiked around, pitched their tent, you know, made a fire, chatted, argued about various things, had a good time out there. And then nightfall came and they put out the fire and decided they go in the tent and go to, uh, go to sleep. And by the middle of the night, the engineer bumps the scientist, says, Hey, he says, he says, look up. The scientist wakes up. He says, yeah. He says, the engineer says, What do you think? And he says, Oh, he says, it's beautiful. Look at all those stars and how wonderful these places and that's Pegasus and that's the North Star there and, and uh, the Big Dipper and so on. He says, you couldn't ask for more. Millions of stars out there. We can see it's a clear night. It's wonderful. So the scientist then turns to the engineer and says, what do you think? And he says, somebody stole our tent. <laughs> He was really an engineer who built steam powered boats. The way he made, he became the richest man in America uh, back in the uh, 19th century it was to have the first all steam fleet uh, going across uh, the Atlantic. I it was the railroads. And the railroads too. But uh, he, he made three different fortunes. One of them was in uh, shipping. And uh, building a, a steam powered ship in those days, there was no steam table. There was no understanding of the materials of construction uh, for a boiler. So it was a somewhat empirical thing that if you got it wrong, uh, sailors died, right? Yeah. But uh, it is, uh, I think maybe that's another example of creating things that are very useful before you understand the science. And using it. heuristics too, because you had empirical data that said this works and that, that doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Another example is at Brooklyn Bridge. Ken Burns has a wonderful documentary on the Brooklyn Bridge, and there's a lot of heuristics on that one. Uh, and where they didn't under this is the late one, uh, 1865 to 75, and they had to do the same thing. So we'll open a, the talk for questions. And uh, Philippe, do you mind handling the questions whilst I check to see if there's any questions? Sure. Uh, All right. The, uh, Webinar. It's important to put the dean to work once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'll just point out to those of who are, who are uh, zooming in that uh, please put questions in the Q&A, uh, not into the chat. All right, Peter has a question. Uh, with regard to the von Karman quotation, uh, this idea of creativity, what's your thoughts about how to introduce innovation and creativity in the engineering curriculum. We really don't emphasize well, that's that. That's a great much. point. And, and in our day, when you and I were in school, it wasn't there, right? Uh, but now I think we're doing it. You have makerspace here. We talked with 
the students who were, uh, and Scott's involved in some of that. Uh, I think you start with the freshman first year, and you, you know, even children be creative in that, that respect. So I think uh, hands on doing things. Uh, Is it enough? You think? Well, that's a start. Uh, but I think we should pound into the heads of the students the word create because it is important. It's important. That's, that's what we're doing. Not just we always say problem solve. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to wait for a problem. You know, you can jobs. Steve Jobs didn't wait for a problem, right? He, he created something that you want to do. So uh, I think that's how I would do it. But I think we're doing we're doing that now. I do, I do, you're doing it here. You're doing it at one like creating a maker space is really a good example of that. I think to be a, a good creator, you have to accept failure. And yeah. I don't think we teach that. Yeah. Right? If, if it's a very we, good we, we tend to teach it in a very linear way, right? as if people already knew what they were doing. But and it always then, works, right? Yeah, it always works, and that's not the case, right? And I, I don't know how to do that. That's, that's and we have to accept the um, failure in order to be creative. And our curriculum is to get a four row GPA, okay? And get all the answers right. It's not to take a chance on something that might fail. Well, just, just give harder tests. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's try that reply from the uh, recording of this. <laughs> Questions, comments, I'm sure. As a physicist trapped, actually as an engineer trapped in a physics department, I very much appreciated your phase diagram. Um, you talked about Frances Arnold and her 20 to the 500 amino acids. People are writing AI software to design drugs. There was a recent article that said if you basically flip the switch from non-toxic to toxic, this program invented 40,000 molecules that included DX. I'm building a robot scientist to test molecules. How do you address the ethics and the dual use of artificial intelligence? You mean to make things like uh, poisonous gas? So? Yeah. So I mean, that the software, this was an academic exercise at a security conference. They flipped the switch on their computer to make program, it toxic. And instead of making non-toxic pharmaceuticals, yeah. they said, go for the most toxic. And I'm building a robot scientist that would be testing these kinds of things. And how do I keep the people who buy my robot scientist from optimizing um, uh, warfare agents? So I said, do I not do the work or do I come up with an ethics program? You know, it's like dynamite, right? Sort of positive purposes and negative purposes. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I mean, this is why we need some some guidance uh, and, and, and from people who think about these things every day. Uh, by the way, I was a chemical officer in the army, so. Uh, so I know the accent. But the, um, uh, I, you know, it, it, I, I, it's a conundrum. I mean, it has to be brought at the national level, and you know, the question is, can you teach people ethics? You know, there was an example of the scientists doing a good job of this um, in, 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 in recombinant DNA. You remember like 20 years ago or 30 years ago, they said, we will not work on these things. And the same with genetic editing. We're not going to create an embryo. Uh, one person in China violated that, but I mean, trying to uh, group consensus that you're not going to do these things. So I think that's probably the way to try to do it. And we, and we uh, Scientists and engineers try to convince people that that's so they can do more with social scientists. I don't think you can prevent it from being misused. I think it's a little bit, uh, there's always going to be somebody who will get it that way. Sure. Yeah, we have a question from Michael Nega. Um, so if we start with the belief that nature and universe are structured and it's being discovered, then isn't science just the reverse engineering of nature? To me, they are the same and essentially any parallel in nature. That said, I applaud the effort of putting them together. That's more of a comment than a question. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Mike is one of our uh, biomedical engineering faculty members. Yeah. I hate questions like that. <laughs> 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 oh, <I didn't> <laughs> <laughs> All right.
more question. Yes. Yeah. John, I'm curious about these two threads. I mean, on one, you, like working in this sort of boundary area where we where we understand uh, things and we're pushing creativity and trying to invent things, the world that we want. And on the other, like trying to predict the unintended consequences. Like we can't, but how do you uh, navigate that space of both trying to be like very knowledgeable about the unintended consequences so that we don't end up with those. And on the other hand, working in a space where you don't actually understand everything yeah. precisely because you're trying to- Well, try the example that gentleman just pointed out is one of the, you know, we know what the unintended consequences, one of the unintended consequences of the technology. Um, I think you do your best. Like Freon, you, didn't, you couldn't see that, right? Who's yeah. gonna see that? You might say, well, anything you put in the atmosphere you ought to think about, Maybe that's the question should be asked, but I don't think they would have answered it then because it's really inert. It seemed inert, it hit ozone. So uh, I, I think you just do your best. You can't be, you can't do it completely, but you're always gonna be, as an engineer, engineering is always gonna be operating in the number. I mean, we're not gonna have no everything. Uh, or else we're, we're, we're gonna be so cautious, we're not gonna produce advanced things. So there's always a little risk uh, of, uh, of something and happen. You just try to minimize it and ask the beginning. Uh, Scott had a good, good uh, example of polypropylene and implants, and uh, uh, people could have found that out before they started using them. Uh, so you can test things, but you'll never be 100% sure. Sure. Ron has a question. So I was, I was just wanting to know a historical perspective because you started out with a very nice historical perspective. How is science in the 1960s, 70s in the US and how is it now? And how has society's attitude towards science and engineering changed from the 1960s and the 70s to now? And how do you see this evolving and going further? And what can the NAE do to influence it, move it in the direction that it should? It's like more than one question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good, we, we just finished a workshop at the National Academy of Engineering on understanding engineering. A woman named Leah Jameson from Purdue was reading it very, really good. But uh, there was, she put together a number, of, we've had several Harris polls conducted about engineering and science. And you can find the, if I can uh, find that results, I'll send back to you. They're, they're public. I'm going to get a copy of their slides. But they ask questions like, uh, what, do you think engineering uh, uh, promotes growth of the economy? 90 some percent said yes. Do you think engineering does things to harm society? 75% of people said yes. So there's a lot of you know, ambiguity there. Uh, engineering came out all right on some things, but it slips some. And science, uh, sometimes the science overshadows the engineering. And so science, for instance, science is viewed as having more integrity less, less uh, harmful to society. Uh, I don't know why it is. Maybe it's because engineering is only noticed when there's a failure. In science, uh, when science fails, no one notices because they're trying to discover something. But th th there's a lot of questions like, we just would answer all your questions, I think. And I'll get that, I'll send that, I'll send that to you. You spoke about, you know, the National Science Foundation creating an engineering directorate in the 80s, and 10 years later, there was yet another new directorate created. And this also goes with sort of the pace of invention, right? I mean, sort of engineering inventions are leading to even more engineering inventions or technology inventions, and the pace is picking up along with the scientific breakthroughs. What perspectives do you, would you like to share with us on that? Because you've obviously seen a long trajectory here over the last... Well, I, I would be cautious about doing too much more because I do believe in basic research and scientific research. And I think I've done some of that. So I'm not coming across. I think you have to balance the things. The balance was too heavy in the basic research first because engineering research is important also. Uh, but you still need basic science research and you still need principal investigators. Not everybody's going to be working on engineering research centers, big teams, and science technology centers. So, you know, life is always about balance. Unfortunately, the pendulum really stops in the middle, right? And like this, everything we're doing. 
So I think we should uh, uh, try to maintain the integrity of the National Science Foundation. I wish it were called National Science and Engineering Foundation. It would be easier to maintain that balance if you had that, because you wouldn't have to argue for engineering. But uh, uh, I think that maintaining that balance is something that we should work towards. We need the basic science. We, we need principal investigators. Or, you know, I, I'm all in favor of trying to measure gravitational waves. It has no direct impact on human beings, but I think it's important for the knowledge base to do those things. That's a great example of a fantastic engineering achievement. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, the, 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 the people, Kip Thorne, whatever, they acknowledged that, that, that that was almost all engineering. To do that interferometer model. Um, so when I was a graduate student at Stanford, they were starting that project and it took what? 35 years. That was 20 some years in the uh, development of that and, and money. But uh, it's an important piece of information for the matter. And I think uh, we'll do that. But, but you've got you to do the other thing. Um, uh, there's, there's a, what's this Zen, Zen proverb, you know? Uh, chop, what is it? Chop wood, carry water, innovate, chop wood, carry water. You know? <laughs> like you always have to do the things that sustain you as well. You know? Peter, we have, we have maybe a last question on the yeah. line. Last question is from Justin. From, uh, uh, with regards to unintended consequences, how do we prevent the next multi generational cleanup disaster from engineering developments that address a pressing problem? while well, deferring having to deal with the consequences as was the case with the Manhattan Project development of the whole of the the radioactive contamination is still being dealt with now and into the future. Um, well, I think that those consequences could have been foreseen. They knew a lot about radiation. I don't think uh, the federal government acted properly in all those cases. Uh, a lot of things were, were swept under the, uh, under the rug. And then, uh, unfortunately though, when that question implies that, that, that nuclear power, maybe no, not applying it. Some people don't want to use nuclear power now because of the, what, what they're talking about, uh, the uh, radioactivity, unintended consequences, and the, the large power plants. But you have to, again, you have to balance um, greenhouse gas effects and global warming with storage of nuclear waste and radioactivity. So, so it's going to be a balancing act on, on that one as well. It could be that since Justin used to work at Oak Ridge National Lab, I mean, there are, are a lot of uh, contamination problems that go back to. Oh, you well, mean, you know, and also in, in up in the um, state of Washington, yeah, uh, right. Hanford. Yeah, yeah. yeah but exactly. What, I, I condemn it because they didn't know what they were going to do with the waste. They said, well, we'll just put it here and store it for the time being. But they had no idea. And now we can't get rid of it. Hanford's still a problem, I think, right? Yeah. So uh, I don't think that's that was socially conscious behavior. Yeah. Well, yeah, on the flip side, though, it was wartime. So oh, war, uh, for wartime, yeah. And it, it, it saved a lot of lives. Uh, the last is a comment from Kelly Zingler to say, good seminar, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Vanderbilt. So uh, I think we might stop there. Uh, uh, Kelly is my assistant. She <laughs> <laughs> had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyhow, let's thank John for <laughs>